When you grow up in abuse, all you know is abuse, and it perpetuates through generations. We've really been trying to ride the wave that occurred after Gabby Petito. Did that help or hurt? It helped us tremendously. We gotta make sure we're not suffering from white woman in the van syndrome. You know, referring to these high profile cases when a person goes missing and everybody suddenly cares. We need to treat Native American cases on the reservation the same way. The Forgotten, a true crime Arizona podcast. My sister was a human being. She had family that loved her. She had children. We get victim blaming. We get shame. It was the same reason everyone kept telling the Sorrel family, Laverta will be back. The assumption was she left on her own accord. And that's what was told to her daughter, Tiffany, and Tiffany's brothers, over and over. She was an alcoholic or that she used drugs, was involved with not very good people. I don't, that's what was told to us. That is kind of what halted a lot of the push to want to look for her because I believe the police were kind of just like, she, she'll be back, you know, she might just be on a binge or a casino or something. And so the victim blaming was a big part of it. The toll it takes on the children when you're pushing that narrative. And I know my brothers and I, we all have our own different trauma responses to everything. And even though I've really pushed myself to, to do well in life, I do still have those issues. That was in 2002. 17 years later, in 2019, it didn't seem like anything was different when Jamie Yazzie disappeared. That's when it struck her Aunt Marilyn. She had been part of the problem without even realizing it. The things they said about Jamie after she went missing is what I used to say about them. You know, other women that went missing. Victim shaming and all that stuff. I didn't know about that. And that's what I was doing before that happened to Jamie. After they found out about that, they just labeled her as an alcoholic. I now know what victim shaming is. I feel bad for thinking that way or even saying those things because now that's where we're at with Jamie. The victim blaming was certainly used to minimize the situation. But that was combined with something else that seemed to halt any progress on these cases. Native Americans were taught, you don't talk about the dead. That has stuck with Jamie's sister, Elena. Our older generation of the like, Native Americans, we were always told, I did just sweep it under the rug, just leave it alone. You mourn for four days? Yeah. Like, so that's what she was kind of taught. And like, even... Then, too, she was kind of told, don't ask questions, just do it. Laverda's husband, Edison, told me the same thing. On the Navajo culture, talking about dead, handling dead people, all that is a big no-no. How do you think these uh, cases get solved when people go missing or are murdered if you don't talk about it? I know, I know that's a problem about it. It's a big problem, up to the younger generation of Native women like the Yazi family, to change. I think the younger generation is like, no, we, we're not gonna do that. Like my grandma says, I have a mouth to talk, so I'm gonna keep talking. <laughs> so. <laughs> I had heard about the MMIW crisis for a few years now. The movement seemed to really pick up momentum in 2020. It had been in the back of my head for a while to do a documentary about it in a podcast season. It was a network show called Alaska Daily, starring Hilary Swink, that reignited my flame to actually do this big project. Because in the show, they also focus on a missing Native women's case in Alaska, and the issues in that disappearance echoed so much of what these Arizona families are dealing with. So I started my research last winter, 
What I didn't know was how pivotal of a time it was for us to do this documentary. And here's the reason why. With this project, we've pulled back the curtain of systemic failure that's led to this crisis. But just as I started my interviews for this, there was a regime change of so many top leaders in Arizona. New governor, new attorney general, new Navajo Nation president, no doubt the most powerful people and positions in this state. We've shined a spotlight on this crisis that it finally deserves, and they have the power to make some changes. And that's where we start. Katie Hobbs, K-A-T-I-E-H-O-B-B-S, and I'm the governor. Before you got to this role, what was your knowledge of the MMIW crisis in Arizona? Well, really, um, it was kind of more what I was hearing um, being talked about nationally and a little bit in the state. I'm thankful because I didn't realize the problem was as big as, as it is here in Arizona. Over the course of this project, we interviewed 16 people. The Arizona governor was one of the last. And that turned out to be a good thing because we had learned so much that needed to be brought to her attention. Just getting this um, on the front page, um, having the, f the weight of the governor's office behind it, I think is really critical to help making it a priority for those law enforcement agencies that are charged with investigating and solving these crimes. This starts with where the investigations begin, on the reservations like Navajo Nation. Police Chief Daryl Noon is already starting to require more from his officers. Within the Navajo Police Department, we created a small detective division to where now their only focus really is following up on missing persons. The, the, the cases that don't have uh, you know, evidence of foul play, they're required every quarter to call the family just to either tell them, hey, you know, we, we don't have any new information for you or you know, we, we just got a lead. We're gonna start doing cold case highlights. And what we're hoping to accomplish with that is bring in family members from the older cases and, and see and make sure that they've all submitted DNA. In an earlier episode this season, Chief Noon talked about how less than a quarter of their recruits in the last class passed the academy because so many of them failed in background checks. Because of that, they're weighing the possibility of lowering their hiring age to 18. In the rest of Arizona, you must be 21 to be a police officer. Does that worry you though, that now you are, you are trying to recruit people who might not be ready? Well, so the, yeah, and, and that's come up in our discussions, but I think what we would look to do is they would have to be 18 by the time they applied. So which means they'll, they'll graduate from the academy right around 19 maybe. And, and what we're looking to do is put those officers in two officer units. The idea is to get a hold of them, get them in the door before they go and do something stupid that you know ruins their chances and uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, this is where we would have to use our Navajo sovereignty and, and to be able to hire at that age. It starts with policing, but ultimately there are things Navajo Nation President Boo Nigren needs to sort out and he's already working on it. Internally, one of the things I wanna focus on is to really move into digitizing a lot of our efforts because even right now you if someone does report something it might be on paper and what if it gets lost have you spoken to new attorney general chris mays and new governor katie hobbs about this crisis yet not yet do you plan to yes i, I, I definitely want to meet with them soon do you expect them to come up here and talk to you and and see the Navajo Nation firsthand for something like this? I think so. I, I think that it's very important for them. I asked Governor Hobbs first. Are you open to that? Oh, absolutely. And then I asked Attorney General Mays. Is that something you're open to? Totally. I'm planning on going to the Navajo Nation uh, soon. This was important. It seemed all three were not only willing to work better together, but excited about the change they can make. The governor and attorney general already seem to be taking steps to strengthen their relationship with our tribes and commit to change. 
they created a missing and murdered Indigenous Peoples Task Force this year with plans already set in motion. My aim is to hire at least one more prosecutor and one more investigator, if not more. My office needs to provide and will be providing additional training to the state's 22 tribes. What this is, how to spot it, how to prevent it. May has had a suggestion right away, something many of us take for granted. One thing that would help is if we could get broadband to the entire Navajo Nation. You know, it's hard to report crimes when you can't call it in, when, when cell service is bad. That type of action would need to come from the governor's office, though, or at least help. So I asked Governor Hobbs about it. So is that something you're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our goal is 100% connectivity in the state. In this episode, you heard Governor Hobbs say she didn't realize how big the MMIW issue is in Arizona before she got into office. And she's quickly learning how much needs to be done. Through my interviews and research, there were two huge issues I learned about that I brought to her attention, hoping they be addressed. I see a real break in how we collect data here. And part of that is other states are required to report missing cases to NamUs, the database NamUs, which is huge. Arizona is not required to do that. Is that something you can change? It would probably need a statutory change, but certainly I would um, assume that might be included in the recommendations of the study committee and something that we could look at uh, making sure is part of our legislative agenda. Is that something you would want to see required and support? And if that bill made it to your desk, is that something you would sign? Yeah, I mean, I think I, work, I worked as a social worker before I got here and um, worked specifically with crime victims. I know that underreporting is an issue across the board when it comes to, to especially violent crime. Um, and there are a lot of barriers uh, besides just requirements to report. Uh, so I think um, looking at how we can address some of those barriers would be important to make legislation that required reporting uh, successful. But, um, but yeah, certainly um, whatever tool we can create to help address this issue is important. No doubt, reliable data is crucial. The other problem, all evidence processed on a federal case is only being sent to the FBI's lab at Quantico, where it can take years to be processed, like in Jamie's case. Obviously, the FBI is, is a department of the federal government. If they're not doing due diligence on these crimes, that, that, that they reprioritize and make them a priority. If we have the capacity at the state lab and we can work out an interagency or intergovernmental agreement to get those things uh, tested here, um, I'm more than happy to help facilitate that. I think that's in incredibly important in terms of, of bringing justice. Is this something you could take to President Biden and say, we need more help in Arizona to fight this? Yeah, it's absolutely something I'd be willing to have that conversation with him about. Just a couple years ago, it was attorney Darlene Gomez who was reaching out to Native families in Arizona and New Mexico, trying to help them. There just wasn't much traction. Now, she's getting messages flooding in from all over the country. So Arizona, New Mexico, I'm getting calls from the Dakotas, from Montana, from Alaska, California. It's really expanded. Because Darlene has been working pro bono for these families as their attorney, she just can't take on more. But even when she can't take a case, she still helps families through social media, namely TikTok. We've really been trying to ride the wave that occurred after Gabby Petito. Did that help or hurt this? It, it helped us tremendously because then we were able to get out there and do our videos and use the media, Facebook. We were able to call news organizations like yours and say, hey, can you tell the story of our missing indigenous loved one? And, you know, one out of 10 might bite, but at least you have one story going out. Yeah. And then one story became two stories, and then three stories, four, five stories. And that's more than you were ever getting before. Correct. So on TikTok, 
I think my law firm has over 25,000 supporters or followers. We've gotten over, you know, close to a million views on Jamie Ozzie's family. It used to feel like these cases were going nowhere, but for the first time, there's been a feeling of hope for everyone. The first case I worked on was solved. The second case I worked on was solved. Jamie Yazzie's case is going to be tried soon. Because Jamie's case is federal, it's being tried by the U.S. Attorney's Office, headed up by Gary Restaino. I'm so proud of our advocates on the Trey James case. They've met with the family members there at least four times during the course of the investigation. I'm not gonna get into the detail of those conversations. I don't think all of them went well. Um, but I'm so proud of my team for keeping on going back and talking with them. And I, I do think that those conversations and the nature of them have been getting better. Certainly a credit to the tremendous courage um, of the family, but I think also to our lawyers and FBI agent partners. When you say some of them haven't gone well, what do you mean by that? I just mean that there's a natural tension sometimes in trying to give status information before a missing person's case is charged. Right? It's, it's easier once we've got a charge. We are doing our part in empowering victims if they are telling their story, even if their story isn't always supportive of the government and its investigation. We do need to listen more. We need to talk more with the lawyers for some of the victims. This is a good thing that lawyer, that victims or victims' families are getting lawyers. We've got to make sure we're not suffering from white woman in the van syndrome. You know, referring to these rep high profile cases when a a high-profile person goes missing and everybody suddenly cares. We need to treat Native American cases on the reservation the same way. We specifically put that in our own internal guidelines to be mindful of implicit bias. Um, and we train in our office on implicit bias. Um, this doesn't mean that, you know, we've got racist prosecutors by any means. It means that we need to examine um, the biases that we bring and it means that we need to look carefully um, at how we can solve problems. Do you think that there's been a lack of transparency by your office and, and legal prosecutors in general about saying, hey, up front, we can only say this much? It seems like these families have kind of felt like they're in the dark. I think we can do better. Look, transparency is a hallmark of the rule of law. But how do you truly stop this? when it's gone on for hundreds of years. It's something former lawmaker Jennifer Germain specifically addresses in the recommendations they made from their study. We need more resources into mental health care. We need more resources into behavioral health, especially in rural communities, especially in tribal communities. We need resources into sober living. A lot of problems stem from self-medicating and they're self-medicating from the trauma that they have lived growing up. Alcohol. Alcohol, drugs. When you grow up in abuse, all you know is abuse. And it perpetuates through generations. And we are dealing with the legacy of that. And a lot of this ties right back into the founding of our country. The U.S. Attorney and Attorney General know this is a tall task ahead. We want to be finding people while they're still alive. Um, and so getting um, quicker responses out there. I think we also want to be intervening in these, those communities to stop the drivers of violence. It's not going to be solved overnight. We have a lot of work to do. I was only 14, so I, did, I don't think I really understood the dynamics of relationships at that time. As she's gotten older, Tiffany Sorrell has changed. She's matured, she's gained so much more knowledge, and she's decided she wants to make a difference in the MMIW crisis. She also wants to know what happened to her mom, Laverta Sorrell. Her personal story through the eyes of a child has been one of the most powerful parts of this project. But she's claiming back power in her 30s that she didn't have before, on nobody else's terms but her own, even if it means what she believes as an adult casts suspicion on her own father. So do you think your dad has a, a part in your mom's disappearance? The way I think about it is, if something doesn't make sense, 
it's probably not true. Coming up on episode six of The Forgotten. Pretty much I told him that I think you had something to do with it. The FBI are, are uh, pressured by her side of the family to, to provide, you know, to, to solve this thing. Can I very simply ask you point blank if you were involved in her disappearance, yes or no? True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. 